So the uh, next piece of legislation we're looking at here is the surveillance legislation amendment in brackets identify and disrupt bill of 2020. And of course that uh, is before, uh, or it's out for submission at the moment. Um, and the submissions to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. Intelligence and Security. JCIS. So tell us a little bit about this. Uh, let's call it the Identify and Disrupt Bill. I think that's what we're all, everyone's referring to it as. Um, it was introduced on uh, the 3rd of December 2020. So very interesting timing on that as well. We've had a pandemic. Everyone's been very distracted by that. And suddenly, on the you know three weeks before Christmas, uh, the minister brings to the parliament a bill and um, to uh, amend the surveillance legislation. I think it went straight to the parliament. Went straight to the committee. hasn't then passed through either house. The committee submissions, as we said, are due to close shortly, and then presumably there'll be some recommendations. The government will weigh those, decide if they want to accept or reject, mm. and then it will go up for the vote. So. Um, Patrick, tell us what you think the, um, I don't know how to say this, the high points and the low yeah. points, or maybe we want to just go to the low points. I mean, well, what worries you about this, if anything? The, the remarkable thing about this legislation, Peter, was it just came out of the blue. Mm. Right? We weren't uh, expecting it. We didn't know that the government was thinking about these issues. And, um, you know, it's a significant um, set of new powers. Um, it amends the uh, Surveillance Devices Act, which is the... Uh, federal um, led act used by uh, mainly the Australian Federal Police, but can also be used by other agencies to get access to um, uh, um, computer information and um, to put in place um, tracking and surveillance devices. Mm -hmm. And they um, are basically, the, the bill has a pretty repeating framework where um, the, the power is described. Um, if um, the um, police officer has a reasonable suspicion that a relevant offence is occurring and it's reasonable and proportionate to get the warrant mm -hmm. and they go to the police, they go to the, um, a, a judge or the administrative appeals tribunal and get a, a, a warrant and then from the warrant they then, um, the, the relevant judicial officer has to have regard to certain matters and then the warrant is issued and they can execute it. Mm -hmm. So, um, the, what this legislation does is create three new kinds of warrant. The first one is the, um, the a disruption warrant. Mm -hmm. And uh, this can be targeted at any kind of computer, um, you know, owned by, um, uh, either identified by who owns it or identified by where it is, that um, uh, has data on it that is associated with a, um, a qualifying offence, which I think is three years penalty of imprisonment or more. Right. And uh, in that case, the warrant can authorise the entry to the premises um, and all things reasonable and incidental to um, uh, um, impeding the offence mm -hmm. by disrupting the data. Um, and so... Um, so that's the disrupt uh, aspect of this legislation. Uh, just hold you there for a minute. I just want to backtrack a, a second to say this, this bill is clearly... Um, addressing uh, the frustration, we might say, of law enforcement agencies that up to now might have argued that in a new digital environment, they have a decreased capability to actually uh, investigate crimes because yep. of the nature of digital communications. Mm -hmm. And so this bill is coming on the top of the preceding legislation on which it, which it amends, and it's giving uh, new powers to law enforcement agencies and national security agencies as well? Uh, I think um, it's a good question. I don't think the Surveillance Devices Act is used by the national security agencies. It's uh, used by the um, Crimes Commission mm -hmm. and by um, some police integrity agencies, but right. uh, um, the uh, the national security agencies have their own powers for right. this kind of stuff. Right, right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we don't even necessarily know what they all are. So. Oh, no, they're there. You can, you can find them in the ASIO Act. There's okay. some very... Um, you know, interesting powers that often, if they're like this, they can be exercised only with the input from the Attorney General. Right, okay. So let's go back. So we're saying there's three new warrants. You've just described the first one, which is effectively the disrupt warrant. Right. 
and that's defined as being able, capable, being able to um, amend, delete, uh, add to um, information on a computer. So hypothetically, a, a situation might be where uh, the police suspect an individual. And what's the threshold here? Is it reasonable suspicion or is it... Uh, yeah, reasonably suspect. Yeah. And, and of course, the other um, proviso there that you just explained was that it must be associated with an offence that carries a prison term of three years yeah. or more. Mm -hmm. So it's a serious offence. And interestingly, you know, it's got to be the computer that's the target needs to be associated with the offence. I find that quite comforting. It quite narrows um, down the, the target. But there's nothing that says that well, the offender needs to own the computer. <laughs> but then how would they know before they've done the investigation? Would it be through the identifying information of the device itself on the network, the MAC address? It or... might be, yeah. Or, right. Or it could, they could have an insider or they could be tracking somebody right. individually. So they've got to have a reasonable suspicion that that particular computer is yeah. somehow involved in the offence. Yeah. And now they get a warrant from a magistrate. Yeah and they can go in without notice, yep. raid the place, and then they can do certain things to the computer. So hypothetically, they might not uh, want to tip off the person at the other end of the communication, so they might change a file or a communication, send it from that device. I'm just giving you one hypothetical example. We're gonna meet at the coffee shop at 8 p.m. tonight, be there with the goods yep. type of thing and that, then they've effectively disrupted the, the crime, the crime mm -hmm. by interfering with the device or some, I mean, uh, changing some content on the device that's then used in the communication. That's right. I mean, there's a, um, the, the Act has a concept of protective information and the, uh, the disrupt warrant is added to that, and mm -hmm. which means that you can't disclose the existence of the warrant right. without a penalty two years in prison, okay. maximum penalty. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, um, oh yes, the, like the encryption bill, um, the, the uh, powers that uh, the warrant can authorise concealment of the actions taken to, to of the disruption. So the oh, steps okay. necessary to cover your tracks. So they can break into the house when no one's there. Is that right? Now, if there's a warrant, they 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 couldn't conceal. Well, it's, if the warrant says you can enter premises, then <laughs> you can enter premises. Oh, so you don't have to present it to a person that's there. They can break in, relying on the warrant, using reasonable force. Yeah. Right. Then change the device, do what you want to do, wipe your fingerprints off the door handle on the <laughs> way out. That's. I mean, that's that's one. Uh, that seems to me, um, mm -hmm. from what I, from, from the way the laws are written, it's quite possible. Right. Under good. what I could say. Anyway, tell so, us about the second. So, so yeah, the second one is about identifying a criminal network, mm -hmm. and it's a warrant to um, obtain information on a computer or device which would assist in identifying a criminal network. So this is a different thing. And again, the, the the computer here is not limited. There isn't anything that says it needs to be one which holds information that's associated with the offence. Right. So this is a warrant that could be delivered to a social media company mm -hmm. or to a computer service provider or someone saying, you know, we know that these guys are using your app and we want you to um, tell us who's in this in this chat room or who's in this um, this networked group. Right. So a, com a completely new um, power which the police will have in the act there. It's subject to the same um, a set of amendments. It, the, the, um, it goes into the um, protect, that protected information definition, and, right. the, and the, therefore can't be talked about. And also, the right of concealment is there. And is it the same legal threshold that, that has the, that triggers the warrant that it's relevant a reasonable event. suspicion of an event? Of yeah, relevant offence. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So, right. Well, the third one is a, a warrant to take over an account. Mm. Uh, so um, exactly that. So you know. Uh, go for the particular account of a particular person and take it over. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, in the discussions that took place around industry with the encryption bill, you know, one of the sort of, sort of feedback I got from time to time from government representatives is that you know the industry was a little paranoid about just how sophisticated the police or the agencies might be. Mm. That one of the things they they might want to use the powers for is just to redirect the password reset email. 
right so that they can then get into the account mm -hmm. um, and uh, but here we have you know a straight out warrant from a judge to go to the provider saying you know that account it might belong to Peter Cronius but it now it's now the AFP that will be running that account. Boy, <laughs> I better watch what I post. Um, so again a very significant new power here yeah? one that um, I, I'd just say one thing that you said before in, in respect to the second warrant there was a uh, test of the uh, warrant being reasonably necessary and proportionate, or the measures that are sought to be uh, executed and under the warrant had to be, was it? Reasonable and proportionate. Reasonable. Now this brings to mind the language of the Investigatory, Investigatory Powers Act of the UK of 2016, I think it was, mm -hmm. where they used similar, like not identical, but similar language. This is what they're trying to do here is to as assuage the the fears of uh, civil libertarians, this is, that there has to be some check or rein on the police powers there. Is, um, that, is that what they're trying to do with that language? Uh, from my experience in, in, in uh, talking to people, particularly in the context of the encryption bill, the, the concept of something being proportionate did serve um, to mend all ills. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, if you sort of said that, you know, that could cause this ridiculous harm and it could be unfair in this way and this power looks like it's, you know, too high-handed, mm. they would say, no, but we can't exercise it unless it's proportionate. Right, right, right. <laughs> and, um, now, in the, in the Identify and Disrupt Bill, the language is, um, uh, is reasonable and proportionate having regard to the offence, which, you know, is the subject of the suspicion. Right. So, um, as you might imagine, you know, um, that means that if they suspect a terrorist bombing, you know, in the Sydney cricket ground, then really, you know, everything... All bets are off. Bets are off. Yeah. Whereas if they suspect something more trivial, mm -hmm. then all bets are, 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 might be more constrained. The problem is that, um, you know, in comparing these powers, and, and I should say that, you know, um, this is a great example of what we were talking about in the intro, where, you know, a warrant traditionally it was a bit of paper that you know was served to say the police are coming and you could watch the police come and see what they did mm. whereas here this is a secret warrant is now taking over your account mm. and you know that's a huge invasion of somebody's civil liberties right? <laughs> you know there could be all sorts of real things going on in that account and on the basis of a reasonable suspicion right for an offense which, which might is be a pretty quite, low threshold really which we but the offense might be quite serious mm -hmm. and but you know everybody makes mistakes mm. but people might find that they're, they're you know some, something they thought was secure to them and they trusted and was theirs is is um broadly um you know is being um, ta has been taken over for for a law, law enforcement purpose now mm. You know, many times we're going to be grateful that happened and that some offence was prevented, but other other times I think, you know, we might we've got to be very sure that this was only used, um, you know, in the most serious of circumstances and with um, proper um, accountability. Um, and the, the the in comparing the way the power is in the Surveillance Act versus, say, the Encryption Bill, mm -hmm. the more um, both the, the technical assistance notice and the technical capability notice, which are the two um, compulsory powers put into the encryption bill to make a service provider do something to assist law enforcement, both those powers have a consultation step. Right. And it's reasonable to go and... Uh, the, the, to talk to the provider. Yeah, yeah. The, the consultation step can be omitted mm. in, if it's urgent and necessary. But, um, but in the case of the capability notice, which is the one where it could be made to build something to assist law enforcement, right. the consultation is compulsory. It's mm. 30 days and you mm. get time to make submissions. Right. So you'd think that you know, if somebody's um, uh, coming in to disrupt a computer, which ha you know, might well be running an ice game or doing something terrible, but it's a cloud computer in a server where lots of, there are lots of interdependencies, probably a good idea if they consulted mm -hmm. before they came in and did that mm -hmm. and just sort of understood what they were dealing with and how it was happening and how can you make that assessment of what's reasonable and proportionate mm -hmm. unless you really understand your target and have checked so um it may be around some of these powers there should be um a distinction between sort of a hostile attack on the um the person running the dark web from their bedroom versus 
um, um, uh, uh, using the powers on a, a, um, a legitimate and well-established provider who yeah. is going to help law enforcement. A data centre, for example. Yeah. And, and the, there should be a distinction which requires right. law enforcement to ask first and check first and, uh, and for the um, person who's making that assessment of what's reasonable and proportionate to mm. be informed mm. as to you know exactly what is likely to happen, mm. not from the police assessment, but from a, some assessment by the party who actually understands the whole thing fully. So I'm hearing in my own mind, as you're saying it, language like if we were writing a code of practice, we might say something like, uh, the consequential impacts on innocent or unrelated third parties yeah. mm. might be a test that you could put in there as a circuit breaker. Yeah or at least an intermediate step yep. uh, that would give, I think, better proportionality, actually, yep. good meaning to proportionality. Yep. Now, interestingly, the, the bill deals with, you know, the um, potential for adverse consequences flowing from the execution of the warrant. Mm. But um, it basically um, only allows for the possibility of um, police liability if they act outside the authorised power. Okay. So to the extent that what they do is what they're authorised to do, there's no reward, no um, uh, compensation. But what you've already said is that the authorised power itself is extremely broad. So it'd be pretty hard to act outside the scope of the authorised power unless they're on a total frolic. Is oh, that well, really, would well, you? Well, well, that's interesting. I mean, because, you know, the, 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 the power to issue the warrants includes a power to do things that are incidental to the execution that's of the That's what I mean. Itself. So yeah. that's very broad. Yeah. yeah. So you'd have to be like, you know, going in, um, you know, going into the refrigerator and helping yourself to the milk or something. I mean, <laughs> something so far removed from... Well, look, on, you know, on a search with a physical warrant, you know, it's, it's regarded as, um, you know, reasonable to break open containers and, you know, locked drawers and... Right to do the search. So the milk may not even be safe either. All right, well, look, thank you, Patrick. That was the Surveillance Legislation Amendment Identifying Disrupt Bill, which is before the PJCIS at the moment, with submissions to close shortly. And then we'll anticipate a release of some kind of report, uh, some recommendations, and then presumably we'll see the, the way that the uh, some of the objections or concerns that you've mentioned have been either dismissed or taken on board by the government before the legislation goes for the vote. If anybody had time to read it between two, you know, December or when it was released and the 12th of It's always <laughs> funny the way that these things are right on Christmas. Yeah. Okay, now in a moment we're going to go to the third and final piece of legislation that we're looking at today, and that will be the mandatory data retention regime.